So, Johnny Reb, what should we talk about on this episode? Hmm. Black Confederates? Um, no. The glorious reputation of Robert E. Lee? No. That whole thing about how the South only lost because of the overwhelming resources of the North? Hmm. No. <clears throat> Slaves were happy and treated well? Ugh. God, no. That's batshit even for you. True. I'm a cartoon character, not an idiot. Oh! What about Sherman's march on Atlanta when he burned everything in his path? I'm sure to you that's not a war crime because you have unionized tunnel vision. So war crime is a really loaded term, and in this case, blatant hyperbole. But that's not completely crazy to say. Some of Sherman's boys did some pretty fucked up shit. Mm. Checkmate, Lincolnites! <laughs> What you got there, Billy Yank? Why, this is my brand new Witchfinder General t-shirt. A truly high quality item I acquired at a reasonable price from the Atun Shea Films merch store. That's the man who slapped me. It is. What's that you're wearing? Why, this is my Checkmate Lincolnites t-shirt, which is currently available in both Yankee Blue and Rebel Gray. Wow, that looks really comfortable. It's actually a, a little bit scratchy. I, I don't know about the... Uh, I, it's incredibly comfortable. I couldn't be happier with my purchase from www.teespring.com slash store slash Films. That's right, Johnny. At teespring.com slash stores slash Films, you'll find shirts, hoodies, mugs, even phone cases featuring your favorite characters and inside jokes from the channel. Each item features classy original artwork that you won't be embarrassed to wear out in public. And that's not all. Order before midnight Central American time tonight and get 10% off your purchase with the promo code Uncle Billy. What value! But my generous patrons get the best deal of all. For the foreseeable future, $5 or more patrons get 25% off with a secret promo code visible only to them. That's an incredible deal. I know! Go to www.teespring.com slash store slash Films now and get a piece of history shipped right to your door. Oh, God, where's this? Fucking How thing embarrassing. Off. Wait, who are we going to talk about again? Uh... Sheridan, right? Wasn't it Sheridan? Slocum? Sickles! Sherman. That's right. You going to talk about the memes? How could I not talk about the memes? Oh, way down south in the land of traitors, rattlesnakes and alligators. Ridiculous Yankee lies. Celebrating a man who brought untold suffering on the south. Come on, man. That's not fair. The memes are clearly tongue-in-cheek. You know how you guys consider Stonewall Jackson to be like the embodiment of Confederate big dick energy? Well, it's the same with us and Sherman. It's not so much a celebration of Sherman himself, but more our idea of Sherman. A fiery force of patriotic nature that kicks slave owner ass. And unlike you guys, we understand that distinction. In many ways, Sherman was absolutely awful. We don't have to delude ourselves about him like you do about Jackson and Lee. Even if that's true. You don't have to go very far into our Sherman posting to see all kinds of drivel insulting modern-day Southerners. Or conservatives. Well, there's literally a community rule in that subreddit that forbids pointless South bashing. What about the other Sherman meme groups on Facebook and elsewhere? What about your own fan base? Are you going to deny that there's an undercurrent of anti-Southern, anti-rural prejudice among the so-called Union Gang? If Lee, Early, and Davis had been hanged like the traitors they were, this country would be better off now. See? LOL. The South will rise again at some point. Individually, in industrial-grade manlets. Their cavalry consisting of 500-pound burger receptacles maneuvering on their rascal scooters they stole at Walmart. How dare you, sir? Inbred, low-IQ, southern hick freaks. <gasps> oh my god. I'm so sorry, dude. Damn you, sir. If I had a glove, I would throw it at your feet this instant. And I wouldn't blame you. What kind of unbelievable asshole can't distinguish between slave-owning Confederates and modern-day rural Southerners? Furthermore, how do you come to terms with the fact that Sherman had no moral qualms about slavery and was quite a racist himself? His problem with us was that we declared independence, not that we supported slavery. I mean, states' rights. That's true. Uh, Sherman lived in the South for years prior to the war and wasn't particularly anti-slavery. He did think that it was an inefficient and outdated labor system, though, 
and thought it was pretty much inevitable that slave states would be overwhelmed by a coalition of free states in Congress. He probably had a point. Exactly. Should the South have won, slavery was on its way out, collapsing under its own weight. Would have ended anyhow. That's certainly a valid what-if scenario, but there's less evidence for it than you might think. Yes, certainly. Uh, slavery was on the way out, globally, and abolitionism was on the rise. But I actually think that makes the Confederacy look even worse and more reactionary. Because you can't simultaneously make the argument that slavery would have gone away on its own and we can't judge the Confederates for keeping slaves because that was the norm back then. But in fact, slavery in the South was still going strong in 1860. That year, the net value of American slaves was approximately $2.5 billion. And slaves weren't just valuable assets, they were investments. The cost of paying for a single slave for life was way cheaper than paying a wage worker, even in the later antebellum days when the price of slaves rose to record heights. And many slave owners purchased women to use them basically as broodmares. The children of slaves also became slaves, and the masters worked them or sold them for enormous profit. Slavery was so lucrative that I find it highly unlikely that it would have ended without significant political pressure from abroad, and in my opinion, probably not for at least a generation after a hypothetical Confederate victory. But what about industrialization? Surely a victorious Confederacy? Mm -hmm. My heart flutters at the thumb. Surely it would be forced to change to keep up with the rest of the world. And secessionists gave that a lot of thought. First of all, it's not like agriculture ceased to be profitable once industry overtook it. We still rely heavily on agriculture today, primarily to feed ourselves. Bread isn't grown in a lab. And Confederates understood that a slave society wasn't necessarily incompatible with an industrial economy. In fact, they saw it as a plus. Unlike the North or Great Britain, they could urbanize and industrialize with an already subservient workforce and not have to worry about class conflict. The North industrialized using immigrants and the rural poor. Why couldn't the South have done the same with slaves? Confederates knew that their economy had to modernize, but they correctly understood that they wouldn't need to sacrifice Camera's slavery right now. to do uh, that. We're filming. In their public discourse, speeches, editorials, and pamphlets, the planter class placed much less importance mm. on their Jeffersonian agrarian ideals and much more on them gaining economic independence from the North through internal oh, no. industrialization. Ha and they believed the best way to do this was through the directive of the state, not private interests. As we've well, talked about before, the Confederacy was have... way more centralized than most people give it credit for. And there's ample how evidence you know to suggest that in the event fallacy? of a Southern victory, the central Confederate government would have become even stronger as it directed private right interests to create economic and industrial power Good. that would effectively compete with that of the North. So, Sherman. Yes, Sherman. What exactly is your problem with him? What's my problem? What is my problem? Sherman's march made what the Nazis did to Russia and the Japanese did to everyone look sweet and pleasant. That's crazy talk, and you know it. I'm not going to defend Sherman's mistreatment of civilians, which definitely happened and I'm sure we'll get to it. Damn right we will. But let's discuss this within the bounds of reality. There's just no evidence to corroborate the post-war legends of Union regulars committing mass rape and murder. There's just not. To the contrary, at the beginning of the war, President Lincoln and many Northern politicians actually urged the military to tread lightly in the South. They believed that the Confederacy was not a sovereign enemy nation, but a region in rebellion, and so Southern civilians had the same rights and privileges that Northern ones did. They also believed, erroneously, that most lower-class Southerners had strong Unionist sentiments, and they didn't want to alienate those people by abusing them. So, for the most part, at the beginning of the war, the Union Army treated Southern civilians with remarkable cordiality and restraint. Cordiality? Restraint? You do realize this was an army, correct? Thousands of young men with guns? How do you think these Mud Seal Yankees ate? They stole from civilians. And y'all didn't just stop with food, you took valuables too. Anything you could carry. That's a great point, but... 
Confederate soldiers stole from Southern civilians too. Mostly just for food, but during the Atlanta campaign and the March to the Sea, Joe Wheeler's Confederate cavalry was infamous for plundering private homes, for money, jewelry, trophies, and this disgusted other Confederate units. What about ism drinking game? Sure, but we can't have this discussion unless we establish a distinction between unbridled violent cruelty on one hand and the foraging and theft that accompanied every army during this period on the other. Cordiality and restraint, well I never. Just more northern propaganda trying to prop up Lincoln and trying to justify why they invaded a sovereign nation. Burning houses, barns, killing livestock, along with the rape and murder of thousands of innocent people. So the second thing didn't happen on anywhere even close to that scale, but the first sure did. And there were reasons for that. Keeping southern property intact just seemed like good PR for the Union Army at first. But then the Confederates started winning. And they kept winning. And the more time they spent on campaign, the more a lot of United States soldiers realized that lower class Southerners really detested them. So all of a sudden, the idea of conciliatory warfare didn't really make strategic sense anymore. Sherman himself underwent a drastic change of perspective on this issue. As commander of federal forces in Kentucky late in 1861, he severely punished federal soldiers who stole from civilians. He even forcibly returned fugitive slaves back to their masters. But over the next two years, his heart began to harden against the South. He came to believe that there was no real distinction between the Confederate government and military who had started the war and the civilian Southern populace who were complicit in it. They were all rebels, guilty of treason. To Sherman, there was no point trying to win hearts and minds. The only way to crush Southerners' wartime spirit was through overwhelming destructive force. By November of 1863, Sherman believed firmly that It is none of our business to protect a people that has sent all its youth, and arms and horses, and all that is of any account to war against us. The people have done all the harm they can, so let them reap the consequences. That's right. He advocated total war tactics against the South directly targeting homes. That's misleading. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were examples of total war. Total war, by definition, is the most horrifying and extreme method of warfare possible. Sherman was ruthless. Yes, he was hard-handed. But he wasn't indiscriminately violent. There's a distinction there. Besides, the concept of total war didn't even exist in the 19th century. Give it a name. Scorched earth, hard war, don't it more or less describe the same thing? The fact is, Sherman cut a swath of destruction and terror from Chattanooga to Atlanta, from there to the sea, and up through the Carolinas. That is historic fact. No doubt. A shocking and unprecedented display of violence from the meddling Yankee. To be fair, most of Sherman's soldiers spent the entire march to the sea either, well, marching or in camp. It was the bummers, those stragglers and foragers on the outskirts of the army, who truly lived up to the lost cause stereotype of the rampaging, pillaging Union soldier. They burned empty houses and looted inhabited ones. They taunted, robbed, and insulted Southern civilians, rich and poor, black and white. Violence was uncommon on the march, but not negligibly rare. Namely, beatings, rapes, sometimes even murders. And that's not defensible. As students of history, we should attempt to understand that violence, but we should never try to condone it or defend it. And there's also a lot of disagreement about the extent of these violent crimes. Personally, I think they absolutely happened. I don't see how they couldn't have in that sort of situation, with an army marching through a rich countryside. In particular, the rape. That's a crime that more often than not just goes unreported. Sherman himself fervently denied these charges in his memoirs, though I don't entirely believe him. No doubt many acts of pillage were committed by these parties of foragers, usually called bummers. For I have since heard of jewelry taken from women and the plunder of articles that never reached the commissary. But these acts were exceptional and incidental. I never heard of any cases of murder or rape, and no army could have carried along sufficient food and forage for a march of 300 miles so that foraging in some shape was necessary. The country was sparsely settled, with no magistrates or civil authorities who could respond to requisitions, as is done in all the wars of Europe, so that this system of foraging was simply indispensable to our success. And you know, it's important to note that the viciousness of Sherman's march didn't really surprise 
anyone at the time. Well, it probably surprised its victims. There are lots of scary Sherman quotes, like, war is cruelty, war is hell, but less well known are the similar sentiments that were advocated by people on both sides since the beginning of the war. We have this idea, this romantic notion, that men who fought in the Civil War did so reluctantly, citing these lofty goals like unity or state pride. That's certainly how that generation wanted to see themselves, gentlemen warriors fighting a civilized conflict. But scratch the surface and you will find a much more ugly and viciously sectarian truth. In April of 1861, a prominent judge from Wisconsin gave a speech in which he said, The Union Army must restore New Orleans to its native marshes, then march across the country, burn Montgomery to ashes, and serve Charleston in the same way. We must starve, drown, burn shoot the traitors. And that was by no means an unpopular opinion among your rampaging Yankee soldiers. Many Northerners spoke openly of exterminating the people of the South and civilizing the Confederacy as though it was some sort of Southward manifest destiny. And when the brave women of our fair South dared resist them, lion Lincolnites and dirty blue bellies inflicted on unspeakable suffering upon them, and rejoiced at their misery. As one of Sherman's cavalry generals told Virginia Wade, a prominent South Carolina gentlewoman, We shall soon see the women of Carolina as those of Georgia, with tears, begging crusts from our men for their famishing children. Oh, it was glorious to see such a sight. You women keep up this war. We are fighting you. Yeah, that's pretty fucked, though we may want to mention here that rich southern ladies were probably more vicious in their hatred for and condemnation of Union soldiers than their Confederate husbands were. You're justifying it. Not at all. Just seeking to understand it. I tell you, the Yankee invasion was murderous and vile, and the rights of human nature were deeply wounded by this infamous practice. Consider your own wounds, Mr. Johnny Reb, for you are its practitioner. Confederate leaders fully understood that to win the war, they would need to wage it as savagely as possible. They could never match the North for numbers, but what they could do was cause enough mayhem to convince the Northern public that Union wasn't worth the cost of war. Before he had even left the United States Senate in January 1861, Jefferson Davis promised the North that the torch and sword can do their work with dreadful havoc, and starving millions would weep at the stupidity of those who had precipitated them into so sad a policy. Confederates dreamed of laying waste to the North, even after the tide of war had turned against them. In November 1864, Confederate agents tried to burn New York City to the ground by lighting ten fires in hotels all across Manhattan. Pro-Confederate newspapers called for violent, invasive reprisals on the North, often and loudly. Let Yankee cities burn and their fields be laid waste. Let the Negro worshippers have a taste of what we have experienced for two years. The most successful instance of Confederate revenge was Jubal Early's destruction of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania in July of 1864. Unlike cities that Sherman burnt down, Chambersburg didn't have any strategic or symbolic value. Early destroyed it because he was pissed, and it was there. Confederates burned down 300 buildings, robbed civilians at gunpoint, and even shot rifle rounds into their houses. And though Confederate opportunities to desolate the North were few and far between, that was always their intention, and it made a lot of strategic sense. As Stonewall Jackson himself said in September of 1862, as he imagined a hypothetical invasion of Pennsylvania, We must destroy industrial establishments wherever we find them, break up their lands of interior commercial intercourse, close the coal mines, seize and if necessary destroy the manufactories and commerce of Philadelphia and of other large cities within our reach, take and hold the narrow neck of the country between Pittsburgh and Lake Erie, subsist mainly on the country we traverse, and make an unrelenting war amidst their homes, force the people of the North to understand what it will cost them to hold the South in the Union at Bayonet's point. If Stonewall Jackson were in charge, the South would have easily won the so-called Civil War. Would have taken a couple weeks at most. Sherman was only good at burning down old widows' houses. He would send other generals after Forrest to go get beat. He didn't go himself because Nathan would have just bitch slapped him off his horse. That would have been embarrassing for him. <laughs> Probably would have started crying. The fuck you just say? Billy Hank, that's not funny. P put the gun down, please. No, really, I couldn't hear you. Why, why don't you say that again? Please. I didn't. I don't. 
Say it! Fucking say it! I said, Sherman was only gonna put her down old lady's houses. That's actually a common misconception. A lot of people seem to have this idea that Sherman's campaigns in 1864 were purely destructive and terroristic rather than strategic and tactical, but that's simply not true. During the Atlanta campaign, when Sherman fought Confederates under Johnston and later Hood, certainly the Union Army wrecked shit, but otherwise it was a fairly conventional military operation. Destruction was by no means their main objective. A lot is made of Sherman's capture and subsequent burning of Atlanta, but people seem to forget that John Bell Hood's Confederates burned factories and munitions as they were retreating, before Sherman even got there. And when Sherman did burn down Atlanta in November of 1864, he specifically targeted infrastructure of military value. Though, of course, homes were caught up in the conflagration, and Union troops didn't really care. That campaign aside, Sherman marched to the sea unopposed from Atlanta to Savannah without a single major military engagement. That was by design. Sherman marched across Georgia with his army in two columns, each threatening various cities along their route. When Confederate forces would gather in one city or another to try to defend it, the columns would turn abruptly at the last moment toward another target. Sherman didn't even tell his own soldiers what he was planning in that respect. This meant that these disparate Confederate units could never effectively combine to present Sherman with a serious challenge. This fit in with Sherman's whole strategy of a brief, dirty war that would end the fighting as soon as possible. Attacking the resource-rich countryside of Georgia and the Carolinas had another purpose too, because those very same farms that Sherman burned down had been feeding Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia for the past three years. So, by destroying these places, Sherman could actively aid Ulysses S. Grant's war effort in the Eastern Theater, and bring about the end of the war sooner. So the March to the Sea was not mindless destruction by any means. It was just cold and calculated. In your eagerness to defend him, you ignore Sherman's most dastardly act during the war. The act that made the March to the Sea look like child's play. It probably wasn't as bad as you think it was, but it was about the most egregious act of destruction ever committed by the regular Union Army, so it's important we talk about it. You ready to tell the story? Oh, I was born ready. In February 1865, Sherman's army approached Columbia, South Carolina, the birthplace of Southern Secession. The boys in blue were eager to wreak vengeance on this symbolic heart of the Confederacy, and as they marched, many sang, Hail Columbia, happy land. If we don't burn you, I'll be damned. On February 16th, Sherman's men came within sight of the city. He ordered his men to occupy it and destroy public buildings, factories, and railroad property, but to spare private dwellings. Early the next morning, Confederate troops under General Wade Hampton abandoned the city, setting fire to bales of cotton as they fled. Over the next few hours, the damnable Yankees entered the city and found it in chaos. Citizens looted storefronts, and many black men greeted the soldiers with jugs of liquor. By around noon, the vanguard of the occupying force was pretty much wasted. They began to barge into private homes searching for valuables. Thirty or forty drunk soldiers gathered in the state house and voted to repeal secession before defacing a statue of John C. Calhoun. After sundown, the disorder became much less restrained. Black men led Union soldiers to the homes of certain slave owners, including the house of a man who used a pack of bloodhounds to track down escaped slaves. They burned his house down, killed the dogs, and the black men took turns flogging him. Stop smiling! I wasn't. I wasn't. By midnight, fires raged across the city, the biggest being nearly nine blocks long. On Plain Street, the Yankees burned the house of a landlord whose hobby was to collect historic artifacts. The blaze consumed thousands of fossils, a collection of ancient coins, and a series of priceless paintings. There were few murders. The women and children fleeing the chaos were taunted and threatened. Black people were especially vulnerable. At least one black man was shot dead by Union soldiers in the street for perceived impudence. No one was charged for this killing, though thousands of Union soldiers were arrested by their comrades for other offenses. 
At least two Union soldiers were shot dead by their commanding officers for crimes during the riot. As Sherman walked through the burning streets at three o'clock in the morning, he came across a reverend who dared to suggest that burning down a city full of women and children might not be a very moral thing to do. Sherman replied, Your governor is responsible for this. Who ever heard of an evacuated city to be left a depot of liquor for an enemy to occupy? Now my men have got drunk and have got beyond my control. And this is the result. Earlier that evening, Sherman had watched the light of the fire from his headquarters and remarked to a subordinate, They have brought it on themselves. I gotta hand it to you, man. That is some seriously heartless shit. See? He was a war criminal. I win. I... When? So that's what that feels like. At last, my long suffering people, wealthy plantation owners, have won a contest against the Yankee invader. It's not much, but it's victory. Oh, I feel terrific. In your face, Billy Yank. Sherman was evil, and that's that. It's not really that simple. Oh, come on! The question of do the ends justify the means can never really be answered. I'll save that for the YouTubers who talk about philosophy. But from a purely historical perspective, Sherman was right. He broke the back of the Confederacy, hastened the end of the bloodshed, and undoubtedly saved more lives than he destroyed. That's pure speculation. Not really. His methods were effective and the words and actions of Confederates proves it. In the month after the fall of Columbia, 8% of the Army of Northern Virginia deserted. James Longstreet's Corps actually had to set a stronger picket guard in its rear to prevent desertion than in its front to protect against the enemy. And the number one cause of desertion? The news of Sherman's march and the desolation that these soldiers, families, and communities had suffered at home. Among the people of the South, the desire for peace had outgrown the desire for independence. As Georgian author Eliza Francis Andrews put it, I used to feel very brave about Yankees, but since I have passed over Sherman's track and seen what devastation they have made, I am so afraid of them that I believe I shall drop down dead if one of the wretches should come into my presence. Damn, damn Yankees! Rebel Yeah! 70% did not fight for slavery, FFS. The reason you are so lost in rhetoric is virgin on weird. We need no false rewritten lies of the war of northern aggression. What about the slaves in Alamo days? Or the ones in North in wartime. Oh, bullshit. Sherman's a war criminal and ask Indians how good and decent Yankees were. Ask Apache or Sue, you jerbilly clown. Rebel yell! You know, you actually raise a good point. Yes, that only Northerners ever did anything bad to any Indian after the Civil War. No Southerner ever did anything bad to any Indian ever. What? No, that's not what that... Uh, so Sherman, he was commanding general of the United States Army from 1869 to 1883, at the height of the Indian Wars in the West. Sherman didn't like this gig all that much. It was a lot different than the Civil War, for sure. But it was also more of a political position than a military one. He spent most of the time lobbying on behalf of the Army in Washington, and he found the whole thing pretty distasteful. But it's undeniable that he was a willing participant in Manifest Destiny at its nastiest. Sherman wasn't a religious man, but he did believe fervently in the promise of America as a world power. He viewed himself as an instrument of history. And just as he believed during the war that the downfall of slavery was inevitable and that these United States would become the United States, so he also believed that it was inevitable that white Americans would conquer the West from hostile natives by any means necessary. Sherman happily broke treaties and insisted that tribes become civilized, knowing full well that that would lead to their dissolution as cultures and polities. Contrary to popular belief, a lot of white people at the time were not cool with this, and Sherman caught a lot of flack from bleeding heart Easterners due to his severe Western policies. 
but he insisted that it was all for the national good. He believed that his career during the Indian Wars was a direct extension of his Civil War service, and ultimately it was the same struggle. In Sherman's mind, he was an agent of progress, and his justification for everything he did was to bring about his vision of a strong, united, triumphant America that would enter the 20th century. Well, just like that, we're going to end on a downer. Do one of your funny comments. Oh, no, I don't think that's appropriate. Oh, come on, give us one. No, no, really. Do I'm... it, do it, do it, do it. Oh, Crazy comment oh, time. Well, if you insist, then this time the war will be spiritual. This time it will come from space. I will help. I will come from space, from another galaxy. This time y'all will not overcome us. We will overcome you for all eternity. Your technology has no power. There's a higher technology. Once they communicate with us, your life, your time is over. You will fall by the sword. Dude, what the fuck? Bring the good old bugle boys, we'll sing another song. Sing it with a spirit that will start the world along. Sing it as we used to sing it 50,000 strong. While we were marching through Georgia. Oh.